Good morning, everyone, and you're very welcome to our service today on this beautiful spring morning. A few announcements. Just remind the uh, Kirk Session and Committee of the, their meetings on Thursday. That's Kirk Session at 7 and the Congregation Committee at 8 p.m. Then next Sunday will be our monthly family service and we'll be here. And then just uh, a preliminary notice, um, because of the Platinum Jubilee, we have decided to move the Young People's Day a week earlier than we normally have it, so that will be the first Sunday in June. Um, and then we will be having our usual barbecue, which we will turn into a type of party. Um, so that will be the first Sunday in June. Then just a, a request, if any of you would like to be part of the um, IT team, that's those who sit behind the, the, the table up there with all the gadgetry, uh, if you would like to help with that, um, if you would uh, speak to Ian um, and uh, we'll get you trained up and get you part of a, part of a rota. Um, that would be lovely if we could have some more folk helping with that. Those are all the announcements. We come to worship God. The prophet Isaiah had an encounter with God. Um, we read in Isaiah chapter 6 that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each had six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And that encounter with God caused Isaiah some concern because it says, At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And yet the Lord came to him, and we are told that one of the servants flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And then the Lord commissioned him to go. We're going to join that song that the seraphs were singing in our first hymn, which is holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. We stand to sing.
we join in prayer, let us pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we have been praising you. You are our God, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love towards us. We thank you for this world in which we live. We thank you for the beauty all around us as we look out and we see the sunshine, we see the signs of spring. The whole earth is being filled with your glory. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for that grace, that true salvation's plan. Because we recognize, as we've just been singing, that we are sinful people and we cannot look on your perfection. We cannot look at your holiness because we are sinful. But we thank you through Jesus Christ and what he has accomplished for us that we can come into your presence. We can come before your throne. We can worship at your feet. We humbly bow in acknowledgement of your grace. Lord Jesus, we come and we thank you that through what you have done, by coming into this world and living among us and going to the cross, that we are forgiven when we trust in your finished work. You did not grasp glory. You led aside your majesty and you humbled yourself and became obedient to the Father, even to death on a cross. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Spirit of the living God, we thank you that you have come and revealed the truth about Jesus. We thank you that you come and you open our eyes to, to see our need of Christ. You come and you show us our sinfulness and you then point us to Calvary, where burdens are lifted, where we are redeemed, where we become children of God. So, Holy Spirit, we pray that you will be in our midst today. Refresh our memories of what Christ has done. Increase our faith. Help us as we look to Christ that we will love him more and more and we will want to serve him as our master. But we will also follow him as our shepherd. We will know his comfort his blessing, and we pray that in all that we do this day in our service, it will be for our blessing, but most of all, it will be for the glory of Christ, who is our Savior and is our Lord. So hear us as we commit our time to you, our God. We do so through Christ, who taught us to pray as we say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, boys and girls, I wonder, did you have a good time over the holiday time? Did you do things that were really special? Did you go places? I know that there's one place that some people probably would like to go, and I'm sure many went. We know it as Barry's, but maybe someday we'll get used to it being called Curry's. As someone said recently, It'll always be Barry's because Curry's is somewhere where you go and buy your washing machine. Um, but the fun park. I have been there a few times as a, as a child and we took our children there once or twice. I didn't go on very many of the things. I went on the Helter Skelter and enjoyed that. And in days gone by outside there were wee old fashioned cars that went around on the track. That was good fun too. Six months it was. Um, that shows you how long ago. But the fun part, this, there's always something special about those places. Now, here are some other 
I don't know whether you've ever been here. Any been to Alton Towers? No? Okay. Well, has any been, anybody been to this place? You'll not be able to read it too well. Disneyland Paris? Yes? Okay. And what about this place? Park Asterix? Never heard of it. Well, whenever Mary was teaching in a, in a school in Newton Arts, um, their P7s went over to France. And uh, they went to both Disneyland and Park Asterix. Very educational it is, of course, as you know. Mary liked Park Asterix more because of the, of the rides in it. The Big Dipper particularly. I think she nearly pulled the hair out of some man in front of her. But um, great... Great places to have fun. If you like that sort of thing, I don't. But there's always something a wee bit sad about these places. And here's the reason. Do you know what that is? Well, that is a height measurement thing. And if you want to go on some of the rides, you have to be taller than that red bar. And there you are, you have an example. You must be this tall to ride. And I know my grandchildren that sometimes if they go to some of these places, it's a bit disappointing because they might want to go on some of the rides, but they're not allowed. In fact, some of them would like to be a little bit taller. And so uh, they would nearly stretch up or go on their toes to make sure that they could get on a particular ride. There's a limit, there's an age barrier, but mainly the height barrier. And for some of us who are a wee bit vertically challenged, that even some of the rides that are for older ones we still wouldn't get on because we're not tall enough. But it means that there are some things you can't do because you're not either the age or you're not the height. I want to tell you today, boys and girls, there's a verse in the Bible which talks about being able to go places or to go somewhere particular. And here's what it is. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. If you went to some of these theme parks, there may be someone said, I'm sorry, sorry, son, you, you're, you're not tall enough to go that and that one. Sorry, you can't go this, and sorry, you can't go in that. But Jesus says that whoever comes to me, he'll never drive them away. Now, that's wonderful. That's wonderful to know. And there's a, there's a book. Um, I saw the title of it, and I thought the title was wonderful. And here's the title. It says, Never Too Little. Never Too Little. And it's talking about coming to the Lord, to have him as your friend, to have him as your savior. You're never too little to do that. If you know that Jesus Christ loves you, and you know that you need to ask him for forgiveness, and you do that, he'll never drive you away because he loves you so much. You're never too little to come to trust in Jesus. I gave my life to Jesus whenever I was very young. I didn't fully understand everything. There's lots and lots still to learn. But I knew that I needed to be forgiven. And so I gave my life to Jesus and asked him to come into my life and to change me and to take away my sin and make me his child. And I say I was very young. But it is so true. You're never too little to come and trust in Jesus. And that verse, which I think is wonderful, all those the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. You probably remember the story in the Bible where some parents were bringing their children to Jesus and the disciples thought that Jesus was too busy or too tired and they tried to send them away and Jesus was actually very cross with them. And he said, let the children come to me. Don't drive them away because children who put their trust in me are part of the kingdom. You're never too little. Why? Because Jesus' love is very wonderful. And he loves us, each one, and he wants us, each one, no matter what age we are, to come 
and to trust in him. We're going to sing that chorus. Uh, Jesus' love is very wonderful. It's so wide, you, you can't get around it. It's so high, you can't get over it. It's so low, you can't get under it. Why? Because that love is amazing. That love for us. And then after we sing the hymn, the children will then go over to, to the hall to jam. Let's stand to sing. We're going to come with our prayers for others, and John is going to lead us in those. Dear Lord, as we meet together, we thank you for decreasing levels of severe COVID infections, as the success of the vaccine program reduces the severity of illness in the majority of cases. We thank you as we start to see a relaxation of some of the mitigation measures and find that we are able to see some return to normality. Let us appreciate all the more the ability to visit, travel and interact with friends, family and neighbours. We think of the Ukrainian conflict and the suffering of families fleeing the violence. Guide the leaders of Western nations to make wise decisions around the conflict providing the means for Ukraine to defend itself and to support its displaced population. Let us as individuals do what we can in a tangible way to provide practical and financial help to Ukrainian families separated by war. We remember other conflicts too, such as the war in Yemen with almost 400,000 deaths since 2014 and many of these caused by starvation and a collapse of their health care system. We pray, Lord, for a resolution to this conflict and all others. Dear Lord, we think of our children and young people as they approach important exams. We are mindful they have had a fragmented education over the last two years of the pandemic. Be with them as they study and revise. Be with their teachers as they strive to facilitate their learning. We give thanks, Lord, for the many blessings you have given us in our lives through family and friends, even as many today struggle at times due to financial worries and the cost of living. We thank you, Lord, for our church family here in Kilmore of all age groups and the ability we have to meet here. We also thank you for the leadership 
of Mark and Mary and all that they have brought to your church family here. These things, Lord, we bring to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Johnny, for leading us in those prayers. We're going to sing again, and it's, uh, it's an old hymn, um, traditional hymn, but it's a lovely hymn that speaks of our faith in the Lord Jesus and the assurance that we have whenever we come to him. It is entitled, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. We stand to sing. As we come to God's word, let us pray. Father God, we thank you that you have given us your word. And as we come to study it together, we pray that we will know your guidance. That you will help us to understand the words that are there and then be able to apply them to our lives. So, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us. Open our eyes to see. Open our ears to hear and open our hearts to respond so that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts will be acceptable to you, our God, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. There's a word that has come into fashion uh, these days, and it is the word teenager. It wasn't around whenever I was a teenager. Um, you were a child and then you were a teenager and then you became an adult, hopefully. But what is a teenager? Well, it's whenever you're somewhere between 8 and 14, depending on how you mature, not physically but mentally. It's that in-between stage. I was nearly going to put a picture of the in-betweeners, but I thought, no, maybe not, because... Yeah, there's something different. But, teenager, 
It, it's whenever you still haven't quite figured out who you are, what you are. And it's, uh, it's a difficult time for a teenager to work out what's happening. And in the passage of scripture we're going to read, I want you to sort of have that idea of a teenager. Not sure just exactly where you're at or where the people are at, to be more precise, in the passage we have before us. And Geraldine's going to read for us from Hebrews chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 11, and we're going to go through into chapter 6, verse 12. Let's hear God's word. We had much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you, because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though, by this time you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives in milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain often falling on it and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is formed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burnt. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realised. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Amen. And thank you, Geraldine, for reading that for us. In this passage of scripture that begins in verse 11, you need to look at the verse before that to, to see what the writer is getting at. You see, he's been telling them about Melchizedek, who is was a priest in the Old Testament, and how Jesus is part of that priesthood, as it were. But the writer becomes a little bit concerned. He says, I'm telling you all about this, but I'm really not sure that you'll get it. Because we read, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear because you no longer try to understand in the older version of the NIV, it says, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. Now, either way, it means that they're not getting it. They really aren't understanding. They're not with them. I know as a teacher, there have been times I've been at the front and I'm talking away and I look down and I just know they're not with me. They're not with me at all. I have to go go back a bit and really find where they are and then start over again. And the writer's saying to, the, to these people, this church, I've been telling you all about Jesus and about how important he is and, and how it all fits in with the, the Old Testament and how he was prophesied in the Old Testament and you have not really got there, have you? You haven't quite understood. But he says, how long? How long have you been hearing these things? 
Because he says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. Now, he's not saying that everyone who becomes a Christian becomes a preacher or a teacher of the word of God. But what he is saying is that the length of time these people have claimed to be Christians, that they should be sharing that faith with other people. They should be confident in their faith. They should have no problem talking to others about their faith. And he says, you're really stuck in the elementary truths. It's like being the age of Form 1, year 8, but you're still talking about the stuff you learned in P1 or year 1. You haven't moved on in your knowledge, your understanding. And he describes this a wee bit like having milk and not solid food. Those of you who have children, grandchildren, or you, you know that a child that's born needs milk. It can't cope with solid food. And it takes a while to wean it off onto solid. Now, that can be a messy affair, of course, as you know. Whenever they become slightly independent, but not independent enough to be able to get the spoon from the bowl to the mouth without have most of it ending up in the pelican bib, the bib, and then they take it out of the bib. But he says, you're not ready for solid teaching from the Bible. It's like milk. And he says, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Now, what he's saying there is this. The basic gospel message, you've probably got the hold of that, but you need to move on in your Christian life. You need to move on to deeper theological issues. You need to know more about what it is to be a Christian, not just how to become a Christian. But he makes the comparison between babes and the mature. Solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. What he's saying there is this. Whenever you become a Christian, you have got the basics. You realize that you're a sinner. Christ is the savior. And you come to him and you give your life to him. That's the start. But that's not where it ends. You get to know God better. As you train yourself. And what is that training is in the word of God. Delving into the word of God. And by so doing, you will learn the will of God. You will know the ways of God. And you will know how to live as God wishes you to do so. If you haven't got to that stage, then it's a matter of spiritual immaturity. And sadly, there are a lot of spiritual babes. And they're quite content to be there. As I've said many times, they're quite happy to be saved. Saved from a lost eternity. Saved from a hell that is waiting for those who don't trust in Christ. But they're happy just to be saved. And then they just get on with life. As if they have reached the goal of being saved. To go to heaven. But that's it. Nothing more they feel is necessary. But the writer to the Hebrews said, look, let's move away from the elementals. He says, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken, taken forward to maturity. He's again using the illustration of the baby. We expect a baby to grow. If there's a rested development, then we are anxious. And it should be the same in the Christian life. If we are not growing in our Christian lives, then there's something wrong. And so he, he helps them in some ways by saying, look, we don't need to lay again the foundation. And he gives them six things that he regards as being basic. The elementary teaching. 
The first is repentance from acts that lead to death. Now, what's he talking about here? He's talking about us trying to work our way to heaven. We cannot do that because works do not save you. It is by faith we are saved through faith in Christ. It's not, it's not works. And the problem was with the Old Testament was that the Old Testament people were trying to please God by doing things. It was a works-based thing. And unfortunately today there are still people who think that if they have to work their way to heaven and that's not what the Bible teaches. So he says we need to move on. He says repentance is how you get there. And repentance from even trying to, to work your way to heaven. That needs to be repented of. We need to move away from thinking that it's what we do that gets us to heaven. Repentance from acts that lead to death. And then he goes on to emphasize the faith in God. We need to believe what God has done in Christ Jesus. It is by faith. Now, faith is something that can be tricky because we do not always understand everything, but that's not what God wants us to do. He wants us to believe that Jesus Christ has done what he said he would do. When he came and he died on the cross, he came to forgive us. He took the punishment we deserve. And he said, that's the faith in God that God did that for us. And then he goes on to talk about instruction about cleansing rites. Now, in the, the older version of the NIV, it, the, the, the Pew Bibles, it, it, it talks about um, the baptisms. The, the new version talks about cleansing rites. And there were lots of things in the Jewish faith about cleansing they had to wash their hands in a particular way they had to do that before they went to the temple they they had lots of cleansing rites and in the then the christian faith there was baptism which was the entrance into the fellowship of the people and so he's putting all those together and he says look we need to move away from that yes the early apostle says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And then he goes on to say, and be baptized. Because they were coming from paganism or they were coming from Judaism, this baptism was new. So there wasn't the, the covenantal idea there at that stage. But he said, we need to move on from that. Yes, instruction about cleansing rites. Because in those days... There's a, th a, a document called the Didache, which was the, basically the order of how things were done in the early church, written at the, end or, at the latter part of the first century. And it, gave inst it said you you'd be instructed before you're baptized, so that you understood the faith. We said that was just the beginning. Move on from that. And then he talks about the resurrection, sorry, the laying on of hands. And again, this is something that was a blessing. In the Judaism, the father would have blessed the sons. The eldest son got the extra blessing, the laying on of the hands of, on the head. There was also, in the Old Testament, the laying on of the hands of the transfer of sin onto the sacrifice. There was also the laying on of hands whenever they were set apart for a particular job in the faith. And that was carried over in the New Testament where you, you have the blessing and those who were set apart, who were ordained into a special work. He said, we need to, yes, that is basic, but we need to move on. He talks about the resurrection of the dead. That is something that they needed to, to grasp as well, that, that whenever you die, the body dies, but there will be a resurrection there will be that resurrection to eternal life. That's basic, he says. You should have grasped all of that. And of course, when we die, there is the judgment. There is the, the judgment that we all have to face. He says, now these are all things that you've been taught. And he's a little disappointed in them, to put it mildly. 
But he said, look, you shouldn't, we shouldn't have to go over all these things again because you've already been taught them. We should be teaching you more about being Christians and, and how you ought to live. But God permitting, we'll come and we will tell you these again, but we want to move on. But what we've just said is, is are all basics. In the church today, there are many people who are still babes in Christ. And the writer of the Hebrews says, we shouldn't be still babes. We should be growing in our faith. I find this, this poster, and I thought it was quite interesting. You're only young once, but you can stay immature indefinitely. And unfortunately, in the Christian faith, that is the way some people are. They're still immature. And the problem with the, the Hebrew church was they were now being persecuted by the Romans, and some of them were not coping. They weren't coping with the persecution because they weren't strong in their faith. And then the writer moves things ever so slightly. Because he says, look, if you stay in that immature state, you are in danger. You are in danger. And he gives us a scenario here, which many have debated over the years. But let's just read it, first of all. It's impossible for those who've been, one, uh, been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word, of God and the powers of the coming age and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. Now that has always caused people an awful lot of anxiety. Is it possible to be saved and lost? That's basically the question that is being asked here. Now the problem that happens throughout all of Christendom is that we have very often, and sometimes it has even created a new denomination, by taking one passage of scripture or one verse and turning it into that is the basis. That is the whole truth. And you should never do that with scripture. That is a great mistake to base a whole theology on one verse because you have to take the whole of scripture as the word of God. And if you take other verses around, and the one verse that I was telling the children earlier, those who come to Christ in faith, he will never drive away. He talks about those who are in his fold. None can pluck them from my hand. So we have the whole situation of the security of the believer. That when we come in faith and we hand our lives into the hand of God, he will not let us go. And that is true. So what is happening here? Because he goes on to say, to their loss, they're crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Who's he talking about? And I say, this has been the debate for centuries. Is he talking about those who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus and have turned their back on the Lord completely and have nothing to do with them? Is that possible? Lots of debate. But what scenario he is saying here that if a person got to that stage where they have experienced salvation, they've experienced the Holy Spirit, they have, they have known the word of God and how wonderful it is, they have experienced the power of God, but now they're disowning God, they're disowning the Holy Spirit, they are basically crucifying Jesus because they're going back into the camp of those who stood around and said crucify him. Is it possible to get to that state? And well, he's saying it's, it's impossible for someone in that particular state to ever get back to repentance. The impossibility of ever getting back again, that is scary. 
But what he is going on then to do is to give us a little illustration. And he's talking about land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed in the end will be burned. Let me take you back in the New Testament to the story of the seed. The word of God was sown. That's the story of the sower. Or is it the story? Maybe it's better to be the story of the seed. But whatever you want to call it, in that the seed is sown. It is sown. Some goes on the, the, the road and some goes into the stony ground and some goes into the thorny ground and some goes into the good ground. And what that story is telling us is that you can have a response to the word of God. You can. But it's how that develops on the stony ground it didn't even get into the soil because the crows came along and they picked it up and that was the devil taking it away there were those who were enthusiastic at the beginning but fell away there was no root there were those who were in the the thorns and they were doing quite well but then the pressures of the world came around them and they were choked And then there was the good ground. Are we saying that all those other ones apart from the good ground were truly the Lord's? The answer to that is no. Because it says by their fruit you will know them. And it's how it worked out. You see, there's another parable, and there's that of the the weeds, the weeds and the tares. And that little parable that Jesus told was, he says, look, in the church there are those who are truly the Lord's, and there are those who are quite happy to be with everybody else. But they actually are not belonging to the Lord. And that's brutal to say that. And even to say it to you, lovely folk that I love with all my heart. But are there folk sitting here today who do not know the Lord Jesus as their saviour? That pains me. But here we have the illustration of those who belong to the Lord and those. And you remember that story? Whenever the people came along, look, somebody has sown weeds. Well, we'll go and pick them out. He says, no, no, don't leave them. Leave them as they are, because when the harvest comes, we'll sort it out. You see, there will be that judgment. And though there may be an appearance of enthusiasm, an appearance of faith, is it genuine? Is it real? Or is it only a show? But the writer uses that imagery to point that there is the difference. The rain falls on the ground, but the ground can produce different things. The gospel can be preached faithfully, week by week. But what's the response? Is it real? Is it fruitful or is it barren? The next part, which is the last part of it, gives us the hope that what the writer has been doing has been giving them a scenario, the severe scenario. But he says that even though we speak like this, dear friends, we're convinced of better things in your case. So what he's saying is, we don't believe that that is going to happen to you. We don't think that you are the barren land. We don't believe that you're the thorns. Because there has been evidence that you are believers. 
God's not unjust. He will not forget your work and your love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Even though you're spiritual babes, you're still showing signs of faith. And what I'm trying to do is, is to really scare you. Because if you continue on a spiritual basis, you are in danger of losing that edge. You'll become, yes, you may be Christians, but that's about it. You're, you're, you're not being what you should be. Because he says, we want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end. So that you that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what is promised. He wants them to grow as believers. He doesn't want them to be lazy. He doesn't want what somebody, um, in one of the commentaries I was reading, they're quite happy to read a wee verse and say, God bless me the day, amen. And that's as far as your Christian food is concerned. If we are not eager to learn more about God and to communicate with God, then there's something wrong with our spiritual life. So our midweek Bible study and time of prayer should not be the smallest meeting of the church family. And yet in nearly every congregation up and down the land, that is the case. We haven't that hunger to get to know God better. And so he says there should be imitation. We learn by imitation. That little picture there shows you a child doing exactly what the mother's doing. We learn by imitation. And so if we imitate those who have gone before us, Paul was able to say, dear friends, imitate me. Now, I would never say to you, imitate me. But Paul was able to say, imitate me because I love the Lord and I want to get to know him better and I want to grow in my faith. And he says, imitate me. The Lord Jesus was able to say, imitate me. If we want to grow, then we need to imitate what has gone before, that which is good, that which leads us into a closer relationship with God. So in our study today, we we have been thinking of the danger. There are dangers in not growing. We can fall, yes. But remember from other scriptures, what did Peter do? Peter denied the Lord, but he was restored. What did David do in the Old Testament? Major moral fall. But the Lord restored him. But why are those things in Scripture? That's why we need to get to know it better. We learn from what has happened before. So that we don't fall into the same sin or endangering ourselves in our Christian lives. This passage has been talking about immaturity. Can I ask you, are you maturing in your faith? Of course, and you may need to ask, have you got to the first stage of faith? We've been talking about the impossibility of repentance after coming to know about God. And this is where we can take it a little step to the side. Because the problem is that those who have sat under the gospel for years and haven't responded will be judged greater by the Lord. You heard the gospel You know what to do. You knew that you needed to come to Christ, but you didn't do it. You knew it. You'd experienced the grace of God because the love of God had been expressed to you through the gospel, through other Christian friends. What did you do with it? You ignored it. 
You threw it back in their face. And the longer you do that, the harder you become. And so the opportunity for repentance becomes less and less and less and less. Because you become hardened to the gospel. We have been shown imagery in this passage to help us understand that the gospel comes, the gospel truth is rained down upon us through the word of God and through the preaching of the word, but it can have different responses. And what response have you made to it? And for us all who love the Lord, there needs to be that imitation. Imitation of those who've gone before us who were saints in the true sense of the word. Those who had come to know God, set apart by him for salvation and set apart for him for service. But we need to imitate them. We need to get to grips with the word of God and we need to be talking to him in prayer. A child once said in the children's address, it's always about pray and, read the, and pre, pray and read the Bible. That's the only answer you need to any question from the Pope. Because it's been said so often, but actually that's what the Christian life's all about. It's reading the Bible, but don't, not, not just reading it, it's actually putting it into practice. And then it's praying, talking to the one who loves us. And wants us to be part of his family. And wants us to show the family likeness. That's what it's all about. So are you there? Or are you still a teenager? You're not sure what you are. Well today you can be. We sang that beautiful hymn. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine. There is an assurance that we know who we are. And the one in whom we trust. I hope you were able to sing that with enthusiasm, but also truly. And if you haven't, our last hymn is an opportunity because it says, I hear thy welcome voice. And the chorus is, I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed from Calvary. Maybe someone today can sing that and mean it and change their lives forever. Let's pray. Father God, we come and we recognize that your word can be so hard hitting because it really speaks the truth. It can hit hard, it can hit home, but we thank you that the word of God is always written in love because you love the world so much. So, Lord, continue to speak. Challenge us to faith and to growth in that faith for our good and the glory of Christ through whom we pray. Amen. Let's sing that beautiful hymn, I Hear Thy Welcome Voice.
in that <clears throat> famous chapter in John chapter 3, we are told about God's love that he gave his only begotten son. It goes on <clears throat> to say this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Which are you? Let's bless one another with the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.